Okay, Jonah, you ready to get ready to get into it? Sure. Okay. Let's kick it off with something which you actually were posting about earlier today. Um, it's a position which you did not talk about last week, but you made some good points on today, and that is DM. So uh, yep. somebody asked, maybe you could talk a little bit about DM. You know, I know that you wrote a Substack letter on it. As always, everyone, you should go check out Jonah's uh, Substack and, and read through that. Um, someone's asked specifically why DM over SRNE or AONE, but you can kind of talk about DM first, why it's becoming a larger position for you, and then maybe talk about it versus the competition. Yep. So, I mean, I first heard of 3D printing. Other people probably did, you know, close to a decade ago. I mean, I remember even... Like I'm a big um, the TV show Big Bang Theory. Like I'm a big I'm a big fan of the show, and there was even an episode like ten years ago where Howard and Raj ordered a 3D printing machine and they printed out like these crappy little you know dolls for themselves that didn't look realistic. Like that was the old you know the old legacy 1.0 3D printing that I think a lot of people still have ingrained in their brains. Um, and even when uh, a couple of my friends in Boston who are pretty well-known investors, angel investors, they invested in this, the seed round or the angel round of desktop metal, I think five or six years ago. And I didn't really understand it. I didn't really know what this industry was going to turn into and, you know, what the upside potential was. Um, and then desktop, desktop metal went public or announced that they were merging with the SPAC uh, last summer. And some of the investors in that pipe were Kathy Woods, uh, Chamath Papatia, and um, Bill Miller, you know, who's like, you know, he was like the original Amazon bull back in like 2001 when the stock dropped 90%. I think he made Amazon his largest position. I mean, B Bill Miller is one of the best investors over the, the last two decades that probably doesn't get enough attention. And then Ron Barron. Uh, who runs Barron Capital. Uh, he was an early Tesla bull, um, very smart, intelligent, good investor. Those were like the four biggest investors in the pipe of desktop metal. And then you also had like Google Ventures and all bunch, you know, a whole bunch of VCs that invested, I think, $450 million over the first four or five years of de desktop metal being a private company. And then they also have strategic investors like BMW and Ford and Coke Industries. So, you know, clearly, you know, these large clients that are also going to be their customers understand the importance of 3D printing or what we now call additive manufacturing. And desktop metal, as the name implies, um, allows companies to 3D print uh, metal parts. And it's amazing how intricate these parts can actually be. I mean, it blew my mind. I would recommend, you know, read my write-up. But more importantly, there's a lot of links in my write-up to videos that the company has put out. They do a lot of webinars. Uh, and you can see these, these parts being printed in the machines and just how accurate and exact they are. Just incredible. Now, I mean, right now, I think 3D printing is... I mean, so, so there's a huge value add for companies that are doing prototyping still, right? Because when you're doing like the traditional, um, you know, stamping or other forms of manufacturing parts, uh, you need to do, I mean, typically you have, you're doing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of parts in order to get to a reasonable price point. You know, when you have to start putting molds together and, you know, that's extremely expensive. If anyone's ever watched Shark Tank, uh, you know, when in, when some of those entrepreneurs talk about, you know, how much money, they, like literally hundreds of thousands of dollars that they spent on molds alone. You know, imagine being a company that is, you know, trying to build a new product and has to create all of these different molds for parts uh, when they don't even know if that's going to be the actual part that they end up using. It's way more cost effective to design that part with a computer system and then 3D print it. And maybe you only need one part or 10 or 15 or 20 or 100, you know, that way you're not spending thousands of dollars on these molds until you know that you have the right part. But because the cost of 3D printing and the speed has come down so much or the, the speed's gone up, the cost has come down, um, you know, it, it enables there's like there's a chart that I posted on my Twitter thread where 
I believe the cost for additive manufacturing or 3D printing is now cheaper until you get up to like 100,000 parts. You know, then you're then you're still better off going with like the traditional methods, uh, molds and stamping and stuff. Uh, but uh, desktop metal and other uh, additive manufacturers have said that that number is going to keep going up. And in a few years, it might be, you know, 250 or 500,000 parts that you could do cheaper with these machines rather than, you know, going to a third party and having to print it somewhere else and then ship. Cause that's like, that's the other thing. I mean, a lot of these, these, uh, you know, whether it's car companies, aerospace companies, shipbuilders, I mean, think about all the manufacturing industry alone is like a $12 trillion industry, massive. Um, now obviously parts is only part of that, but it's a pretty big part. Um, and you know, if you're, one of these car manufacturers, I mean, these parts that you need to go in your cars could be made anywhere in the world. And then, so you have delays, you have shipping, you have tariffs, import costs, um, all of, you know, port fees and all of that stuff, right? Think about how many times, you know, these, these uh, crates or not crates, but um, containers get stuck on ships in the middle of the sea for weeks or even months on end. Uh, that wouldn't happen if these companies were actually printing their own parts in their own facilities. You know, then they control the process. They can customize these parts as often as they need to. So, I mean, there's just a lot of reason to think that additive manufacturing is going to be this massive industry moving forward. Um, and ARC Investments did a, you know, when they do their like big ideas presentation, you know, one of their big ideas is 3D printing. And they've said that they believe that this can be a $146 billion industry by the end of this decade. Uh, although recently, I think they've said that it could even be uh, bigger than that by the end of the decade, or it could hit that $146 billion number sooner. Right now, the industry is only like $12 billion. So you're looking at a substantial, you know, uh, expansion of the industry. And I expect desktop metal to be one of the leaders, not only because they're doing metals, you know, which is obviously in the name, but because they, they, um, they acquired a company called Envision Tech, which does a lot of polymers. So that's allowed them to get into, uh, like the dental industry, orthodontics, um, you know, where, where you can use 3d printing to make all sorts of, you know, dentures, um, uh, what else? Uh, orthopedics. So, and that's like, uh, I believe the, I'd have to double check the number, but I believe that's a $30 billion TAM right now as it is. Um, so mm -hmm. you have like the metals, you know, when I say metals, like I'm talking steel, copper, you know, all sorts of other composites that you can see on their website. And then you have the polymers. And then today they announced they're getting into wood. So mm -hmm. there's a press release that desktop metal put out today. Um, and that's apparently like a, a trillion dollar industry, which isn't really surprising. But if you think about like wood, right? I mean, you think about like all the railings and deckings and just you know, like chairs and, you know, all the different parts, um, you know, end use parts is what they call it, that could theoretically now be made in these 3D printing machines. So just and then like, you know, they talk about how they can make the parts look like in any sort of. Um, you know, type of wood that you want, uh, you know, custom engraving. And I mean, it's just, it's incredible what 3D printing might actually do for the manufacturing industry moving forward. So I'm mm -hmm. extremely bullish. Uh, Desktop Metal has a really, really experienced um, management team. Uh, three or four of the founders, so there's like seven, I think there's seven founders of the company. And I believe four of them are PhDs from MIT. So we're talking really smart people, uh, desktop metals, IP portfolio. So intellectual property portfolio. I believe there's like 200 patents that are either filed or issued. So really robust patent portfolio. I mean, it's just, there's a lot. You know, and then on top of it, the stock price has pulled back from, let me just double check. I believe was it 40. So back at the height of the SPAC and growth mania, uh, so February 8th, it looks like desktop metal got up to about $35 a share, and today it's under 12 So you're talking a massive, massive pullback in the stock price, yet you know the story hasn't changed, and I would argue that the story's even gotten better over the last two months now that we know the capabilities that they can do wood as well. So um, desktop metal is a top 
seven or eight position for me. And I don't really have any plans of trimming anytime soon. And if I had some fresh cash, I would have no problem adding under $12. I actually added yesterday right around 1220. So got it. Love it. Yeah. That was a strong bull case. Um, appreciate you giving the fundamentals of being transparent with your purchases as well. Um, real quick, a couple pieces of information for everyone in the audience. Um, so just as an introduction, um, so this is obviously everyone knows Jonah. My name is Gov Blacksburg. I'm the COO at Wolf Financial. Wolf is a separate company. I really high, high, highly recommend you check us out. Um, one thing to note with the Twitter spaces, I love making Twitter spaces and running them. Sometimes they do crash. It's how Twitter works. If it does crash, wait 90 seconds. I will recreate the space and we will continue going because the party doesn't stop. Also, this is being recorded currently. Um, not many people have the ability to record Twitter spaces. Actually, there isn't the ability. However, my friend Josh Meltzer, uh, who's an analyst working for Wolf, is also in here recording this space. So I'm going to upload that recording, post this to my YouTube and to my Spotify. Uh, those are both on my pinned tweet. So if you go to my pinned tweet, you can see the YouTube and the Spotify. I have both of the past ones that I've done with Jonah um, up on there. And hopefully we'll you know, continue doing them. So uh, feel free to, you know, sub and check them out and also check out Jonah's YouTube as well because he uploads them there. Um, but let's roll into a couple. Oh, and also if anyone can share out this um, space, you know, I'll certainly give it a like. Uh, would love to just get more people in here as we're running for another probably about 45 minutes. So Jonah, another question that is coming in from the audience. Oh, and everyone in the audience, feel free to, you know, DM me more questions if you would like, is what are your thoughts on non-legacy EV plays after the 2021 run-ups and 2021 pullbacks? non like what do they mean just gross stocks in general uh non legacy ev plays meaning some of the newer ones i guess like not like a gm or whatever that's trying to you know now get a tv but some of these like i don't know plug or uh well yeah, or like I, mean, I don't know some of the newer I, ones yeah i i don't i honestly don't really follow enough of them to know <laughs> i mean there's especially with the spacs i mean there were so many um I, I almost hesitate to even call them e EV companies. I mean, you know, we had Fisker, we had Lucid, um, but then you had like all of these battery companies and autonomous software companies, LIDAR companies, charging companies. And then you have like the hydrogen companies. I, I couldn't follow any, like it, it was too much for me. And I own Tesla for most of last year. So Tesla was my, EV play for 2020. And then we got into 2021. All of that stuff had just gotten had just run so far. I didn't jump in, I didn't want to jump into any of it. So I really didn't follow any of it. So I, I really haven't kept an eye on too many of those companies. If I was to I don't even know where I would start. Like I I don't think I would want anything to do with the LIDAR companies or the battery companies because there's just too many of them. Um, I'd be more inclined to go with a I lose it, I guess, if I had to pick a way to play it other than Tesla. But I mean, if anyone remembers, you know, last year, Tesla broke out or maybe the last 18 months, Tesla broke out. The first, you know, the three, four, five years before that was pretty brutal for Tesla shareholders. You know, it was clearly not a straight line up. And, you know, there was constant rumors about Tesla going bankrupt, you know, because their balance sheet was so weak. Um I don't know. I mean, I think Lucid is going into this with a much stronger balance sheet than Tesla had in the early days. But I don't expect Tesla to have, you know, this flawless launch and, you know, straight up trajectory. So even if someone was looking to kind of um, get into Lucid, hoping that it's the next Tesla, I don't think you need to chase the stock because I'm sure you're going to get plenty of pullbacks along the way. But yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, right now, obviously, I'm focused on my current stocks, you know, if or when I add another EV stock, I just don't know when that might be. I, I just I'm, I'm almost I'm a little overwhelmed by how many options are out there right now. And I'm sure some of the companies are going to blow up and be worthless. And some of them are going to you know grow into very, uh, you know, successful companies. I'm just not ready to, to pick one yet. Got it. Got it. And then another question. Uh, this one kind of breaks the fourth wall a little bit because it's actually about Twitter. And that is Twitter is finally starting to innovate a bit and they're adding some new features, specifically spaces. Spaces have been uh, momentous for so many accounts. Uh, my personal account has grown 7,000% in two months um, with the introduction of spaces. So Twitter is dropped down over the last month. Uh, they've fallen 20% from the highs of $77.5 down back to 53, which is where they were 
uh, pretty much beginning of February before they started that really that huge run up. Um, any thoughts on Twitter? So, I mean, once again, this is a large cap stock and I'm just really not doing much with large cap stocks. I'm still mostly focused on small and mid caps. You know, I do have a couple large caps in there like Neo and Futu. Um, I haven't owned, I don't think I've ever owned Twitter, to be honest. I can't remember. And if I did, it wasn't for very long. Yeah, I mean, I mean, looking at the chart right now, I mean, that's a pretty ugly gap down. Um, you know, I think, I think the knock on Twitter is slowing growth and, uh, you know, lack of monetization, you know, whether or not they're able to monetize or uh, increase user growth with spaces. I don't know. You know, they recently acquired a newsletter company called Review. Uh, I don't know if that's going to move the needle in any way. I mean, I just don't. I mean, I know that whole space between like Review and Substack and Ghost and there's like three or four other ones coming now. I mean, that's going to be pretty competitive. There's going to be a lot of fee pressure for all of them. So whether or not review can even stand out for Twitter, I don't know. I mean, it seems like Substack would have been the better acquisition, but uh, I'm assuming they approached Substack and Substack didn't want to sell at, at whatever price Twitter was proposing. I don't know. Twitter is a tricky one here. I mean, you know, if you look at the charts, obviously over the last couple of years, Pinterest has outperformed. Snap has definitely outperformed. Um, I mean, this, let me just, I haven't looked at the Snap chart in a couple of weeks. Um yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, Snap's Snap's been impressive, impressive since their IPO. I used to think Evan Spiegel was just kind of a, a frat boy that got lucky, but you know, since the IPO, he's executed really well. I mean, last March, uh, Snap got under ten dollars a share, uh, and then it got up to yeah, I I, know, I bought at twelve. Yeah, Do you still are you still holding? It? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty. Uh, oh, yeah, I just have I'm 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 not addicted to Snapchat in any way, shape, or form, but the streaks and the one year memories and the things that they have that that make it so that people there's so many people that use snapchat every single day because they're one of the only major companies that have a real reason to come back every single day keeps me bullish yeah i mean and they've definitely monetized very well you know it's snap you know just with the the way that the ui the ux is set up i mean it it bodes like it lends itself well to the kind of the, the video ads um, and Twitter just doesn't have that, right? Because Twitter is, you know, mostly a, it's a feed, it's text. So it's very easy to scroll through ads. And, you know, I mean, I think Snap, I mean, Snap definitely knows their audience better. I mean, it's also more of a millennial audience. So they can, uh, they can partner with brands that really cater to millennials. Like I remember over the last year or so, I mean, some of the, you know, the ads that I was seeing all the time were Robin Hood and uh, I think Go Puff. Uh, you know, which did like food delivery around college campuses, um, Hims, right, which is like the men's healthcare company. So, you know, I was seeing those ads every single time I got into Snapchat. And I bet those ads performed really, really well with Twitter. Like it just seems the exact opposite. I mean, I can't even remember the last time I saw a, a really good targeted ad on Twitter. It's mostly just crap in my feed that has nothing to do with me. It's like, you know, ads for pharmaceutical drugs that I've never even heard of before, or it's, you know, some CEO of some company that's trying to promote his tweet to get more followers. Like, I, I just think Twitter's done a completely piss poor job of monetizing their audience versus some of these other social media platforms. I mean, look what Facebook, I mean, Facebook announced in their last report that they you know, they, they've increased prices like 30%. I mean, that's some pretty amazing pricing power that I'm sure Twitter does not have. Absolutely. The Facebook ads are insane. Um, now, I know this isn't your main area of focus, but some of these stocks such as Apple, Penn, AMD have had monster earnings, Penn specifically beating earnings by 90% this morning before falling. Oh, man, I'm going to check right now. I know that they were down 8%. Are they still? Yeah, they're still down almost 10%. Um, how do you, what are your thoughts on just the price action that we've continuously seen after companies have blown earnings out of the water? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard. So it's hard to say. Um, I mean, you can look at where these stocks were a year ago and, you know, see how far the stocks have come. Like I'm looking at Penn right now. I mean, this was a, this was a, a four or $5 stock last March. And I get like, obviously, a lot of stocks sold off for different reasons. I mean, even if you look at the stock 
before the crash last March. I mean, it was a, you know, 35 to $40 stock. So, um, you know, a, a couple months ago, right back in the middle of March, Penn, Penn got up to like $140. I think they got over $140. So, I mean, you're looking at, you're thinking of uh, that's a stock that's up, what, almost 4X since like last February before the crash. And I mean, what is that, like 30 or 40X uh, from the lows last March? I mean, that is a monster run. I mean, clearly revenues didn't accelerate 4X. So, and this is what other large cap stocks are dealing with. Um, you know, they saw massive stock appreciation from the, the, you know, the beginning of the pandemic through the end of last year uh, that didn't necessarily correlate with the revenue growth. So you saw massive multiple expansion and like, this is a really tough time for growth investors, just inv investors in general. I mean, you know, like I said this morning, I, the pendulum always swings too far in both directions. Uh, growth got overheated. Now it looks like value got overheated. Stocks like Penn, I don't even know which category you put them in anymore. Um, I mean, when you see companies putting up these monster earnings, like you want to think that they're a growth company, but I think casinos historically have been more value maybe. Um, you know, other industries like home builders. I mean, I think home builders are near all time highs. I think Caterpillar hit an all time high yesterday. You know, those are traditionally value stocks and value industries, but now they're they're being priced like growth industries, like the numbers they're putting up now are just going to continue forever. You know, I think value stocks right now are reporting numbers based off of easy year over year comps because a lot of their businesses were shut down or, you know, really hit hard last spring and summer versus the growth stocks are now running into more difficult year over year comps, right? Because Zoom, Peloton, I mean, these companies saw massive acceleration in their businesses last year. And now this year, the numbers get a lot harder when you start to look at those year over year comparisons. So I don't, I mean, I didn't, I didn't specifically look at Penn's earnings today, so I'm not even sure what was in there or what might've caused this sell off, but uh, and these are tough times, but it's also tough when someone throws me a stock that I just, I really don't know that well. I mean, do I love Penn long-term? Sure. I mean, I think Barstool was a genius acquisition by them. I mean, how much of the current valuation is because of Penn? I mean, it's because of Barstool versus, you know, the underlying casino business. I don't know. Um, you know, I think a lot of these reopening stocks, ripped really, really hard the last few months. I mean, look at Uber. I mean, Uber was probably, you know, one of the classic reopening stocks. Um, but then they bet, you know, they, they did very well last year because of their Uber Eats business. And then everyone, you know, stopped focusing on Uber Eats, which was kind of keeping them afloat and started focusing on the, um, you know, the, the ride sharing business. And, you know, after they've reported earnings, we've realized we've gone back to realizing that ride sharing really isn't a profitable business. So, you know, now Uber is getting re-rated. Um, so this is, I mean, this, these last two months have been almost, I don't know. I mean, unlike anything I've seen in a long time, I mean, it just feels way worse than last March. Um, Cause last, uh, like last March, we were going into that big turndown with multiples at reasonable levels. So you were expanding multiples off of, you know, something reasonable um, and right now you're running into stretch multiples and decelerating revenues, which is not a good combination. So. Right, right. Yeah, I did not realize that Uber was getting smacked so hard. Holy cow. Um, you take a look at that one year graph and you just look at the last. Right. So, the, I mean, so the concern is that and I heard them talking about this on CNBC today. Right. I mean, the Uber Eats business is probably going to slow down as the economy reopens and people want to go out to restaurants and eat, you know, leap you know, use uh, delivery less frequently. But then at the same time, like I heard them, I heard Kramer saying this morning that the the fees, the Uber ride fees have gone up tremendously. Now, I don't know if that's because of more taxes from the states. I don't know if that's because there's less drivers or if there's less riders. So they have to increase the prices in order to make up the difference. I'm not sure what's driving it. But that's a bad combination for a company like Uber, where, you know, Uber Eats is probably half of their revenue. I, I'm just kind of making that up. Let's just pretend it is. You know, if half of your if that half of the business is slowing down and the other half of the business is still hemorrhaging money, that's not great for the stock price. Now, 
you know, does it deserve to be down this much over the last couple of months? I have no idea. I don't know the stock well enough. I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what their projected revenues were or uh, net income. I'm just going to pull it up. Actually, I'm curious to see if they're even projected to be profitable this year. Um, nope. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, they're still losing a ton of money. I mean, they're projected to lose. Uber's not going to, Uber's not going to make money. Like that's the, until they're self-driving, they're not going to make money while they're paying drivers. Right. I mean, there's no way uh, based based on these estimates, um, you know, consensus is for $1.8 billion of losses this year, which is on top of $5 billion of losses last year and 3 billion of losses the year before that. I mean, that is a, that is a lot of accumulated losses, although it looks like they have a shot at breaking even next year, but you know, who's to say, I mean, uh, obviously that depends a lot on, you know, how sticky that uh, food delivery business is. I mean, I still order from DoorDash like once or twice a week. Uh, The fees are not great, but it's still a convenience factor for me. So. Right. Absolutely. Um, Real quick. I'll I'll just say, because I see we have a lot more people came into here. Um, I have a few people requesting. Um, I'm not going to be bringing people up to speak today. However, I'm very much willing to ask your questions. Uh, If you would like to DM them to me, I am consistently checking my DMs. Um, and happy to work with people on that. So no problem at all. Um, also, just want to give a shout out to my boy Pugs, who just hopped in. So thanks for being here, man. Always love having you. And yeah, we're just going to move on to a couple more questions here. So Jonah, one of the things that's obviously happening right now is this rotation, um, perhaps out of growth or there's people shorting growth. Um, is it possible that there's been a rotation into crypto of sorts with many cryptos? You know, I went on to Blockfolio yesterday and I just scrolled down and you look at the three month and everything's up like 700 percent. Um, is it possible that some of the larger players are now moving money into those areas from where they would have before? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I talked to a fund manager yesterday who pulled some money out of small cap growth and put it into crypto. Um, I'm sure others are probably doing the same as well. You know, I'm assuming a lot of the, the newer investors, the Robin Hooders, the millennials, you know, have probably done something similar. You know, they're, I mean, you can just tell the vault. I mean, the volume now, I don't know the last couple of days maybe is not, um, not, not part of this narrative, but the last couple of weeks volume has been very light. Um, so even, even on big down days, it was on pretty light volume. Most of the time, I think options activity is probably pretty similar. So, I mean, there's clearly been a lot less, um, you know, speculating in the market over the last couple months. I mean, that is just going to happen when you see a a big decline. Um, even though, I mean, right now I, I would expect to see, you know, once you start to get to the bottom in growth, you should start to see that option activity pick up where people are, getting, you know, willing to be a little bit more speculative and buy some call options, uh, you know, playing, playing that bounce. Um, it's, it's hard to say, I mean, I'm not a big crypto guy. I don't follow crypto very, very closely. I don't know if anyone's able to even track the inflows, you know, I mean, we obviously have data that tracks inflows in and out of, you know, mutual funds and ETFs and everything else. I I don't know if there's data that tracks inflows and outflows out of crypto. I mean, well, it's all, it's all, I mean, it's all public because it's on the blockchain. So okay. the, da- I mean, the data I mean, is actually part- more transparent than you would argue. Right. I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you what Bitcoin is trading at today. Um, I don't know if it's up or down today or even this week. I just don't follow that stuff very closely. I mean, I personally think Dogecoin might be the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen in 10 or 20 years of being in the markets. It just makes absolutely no fucking sense. I mean, it's just pure speculation because as far as i know there's never going to be a real use case for dogecoin is you can buy you can buy mavericks tickets <laughs> i think that's i think that's the current use case so if you don't live in dallas you're kind of fucked right and oakland A's. <laughs> oakland A's. okay fair enough um let's run through a couple rapid fire and also um shout out to everybody that's joining um you know, helping me build my audience up a little bit. I think I'm going to break through 7,000 for more followers. So thank you all for that. I really do appreciate it and just love bringing value to this community. I promise you, I will try to have spaces every single day, continue to bring value to the community. Um, really, this is, this is my full-time job. So if you're following, I will try not to disappoint you. I put out a ton of content every day. Um, we have several questions on different stocks. So I'll go into this one first. Um, Joan, I believe that you sold out of PAVM, PaveMed. Um, can you talk about why, uh, if you did close that position, you did, and if you plan on ever opening that again? 
Yeah, I mean, I sold that a couple months ago. I mean, that was in the, you know, when, when speculative stocks were pulling back. I mean, I already had a bunch of these types of companies in my portfolio that were, you know, longer term plays, you know, looking for rapid growth, but, you know, two, three years out. And in most cases won't be profitable for another three, four, five years, which probably means more stock offerings along the way and dilution and everything else. And I mean, those stocks can perform very, very well when growth is back in favor and people are willing to pay a premium for high growth and future earnings. But clearly that's just not the market that we're in right now. So, um, you know, I held on to my Durham tech and a few others that kind of fit the same mold, uh, but I wasn't willing to hang on to all of them. So, uh, PaveMed was just one of the ones that got that got cut out. I mean, I still think this could be a, you know, an exciting high growth stock over the next three, four, five years. But it takes a, a special kind of investor that's willing to buy at these depressed prices and hold on to it. I'm, I mean, I'm willing to do that on a lot of my stocks. I just, like I said, I couldn't do it on all of my stocks. So, you know, when when the markets started to uh, crap out back in late February, early March, I mean, I had to begin selling off my lower conviction stocks and consolidating into my higher conviction stocks. And, you know, that's why I consolidated into Upstart and Futu and Dermtech and Mohawk, Celsius, Clearpoint, et cetera. Absolutely. So not, mm-hmm. not, nothing specifically against, you know, PaveMed, just can't, can't own them all. Right, right, right. It's, uh, it's good to have a little bit of diversification, but being concentrated. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wish that I diversified a little bit more into some of the reopening stocks, but, you know, live and learn. I mean, I, I was prepared for a 20, 30% pullback from the highs. I thought that would have been healthy, normal. Um, and then we could have, you know, started to find some support and then, you know, maybe we go sideways for a while. Uh, I did not expect a 40, 50, 60% pullback in a lot of these stocks. Certainly, uh, surpassed my expectations. I mean, it's, it's been brutal. This is, this has been a very tough, uh, pullback, but it, it feels, I mean, this is just my opinion. It feels like we're getting towards the end or the bottom. I mean, I can just tell from the sentiment across FinTwit and my emails and DMS that people are just, I mean, everyone's, th- you know, waving the white flag. I mean, I see people ready to sell everything they have left and hide out in cash and wait for a bounce. Um, go chase the value stocks, you know, uh, sell out and go into crypto. I mean, that's like when you're ready to do that, when you've when you've held on 50, you know, 40, 50 percent pullback and then you're ready to wave the white flag and just give up. Usually that's when you're pretty close to the bottom. And usually that's the wrong thing to do. I mean, normally when you feel that way, you're you're about to get a bounce now whether or not that how far that bounce goes and whether it's sustainable i don't know but i mean a lot of these stocks have been oversold i think the buyers are going to have to come in soon just given the you know the depressed valuations and depressed multiples mm-hmm. not all stocks i mean we're, we're seeing some stocks down 30 40 percent and you know clearly they can go lower than that but there's other stocks i mean upstart for one is is an example i mean i think desktop metal i mean and now obviously i'm talking my own book here uh, but I mean, everyone or some people probably saw that thread that I put up on Upstart. I mean, they've already given us 120 percent revenue guidance for this year. And I think they can get to three billion in revenue over the next four years. Uh, and if they can do that, then, you know, we're talking a thirty five, forty billion dollar company. So, I mean, yes, this sell off sell off sucks in the short term. But like I'm not I'm not stressed about Upstart. I mean, Upstart could pull back to 80. And I wouldn't lose any sleep over it because I didn't buy Upstart trying to flip it for a quick buck. I'm going to be in the stock for the next few years. Absolutely. I'm in a pretty good position with Upstart too. Um, sitting tight there. So uh, first off, I just want to thank the audience. I uh, asked for a 7K and y'all smashed me through it. Um, so that was fantastic. Also, shout out to us, Jonah. This is the largest amount of people we've had on a space together. Um, I saw Sweet. over over 400 people on this space. So these these things are really getting crazy. Um, like I, like I said to Joan in the beginning of this call, I spent this week already maybe 15 hours on spaces, um, just moderating, talking, chatting, asking questions. I've answered hundreds of DMS, um, really gone through and just want to provide every ounce of value to this community. Um, I work basically 50, 60 hours a week on Twitter. It's my job. So again, um, if you join the Wolfpack, I will try not to disappoint you. Let's roll through. Um, so Jonah, you're not going to be there later today. I'm doing a space at 5 PM. You'll probably be pumping metal at the gym. 
uh, that is going to be that is well, going to be. It's, it's funny you say that because one one of the DMs I just got was other than the gym. What are your favorite distractions from the markets on down days? It's a good one. <laughs> I mean, it, it sort of is the gym. I mean, it, it's going for a bike ride. Um, I actually don't even own a car, which is kind of crazy. I mean, I'm probably going to buy one soon, but I haven't owned a car for five years. Uh, I ride my because I was living in Boston for most of the time and traveling um, for my other company, the company I was running before this. So I just didn't need a car. It was, you know, when you live in Boston, it's pointless to own a car and pay two thousand dollars a year for insurance and five hundred dollars a month for a spot in a parking garage. So, you know, I walked, rode my bike, took the subway, took Uber, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's like, that's, you know, now that the weather's getting nicer, I mean, I like to go for a bike ride in the middle of the day just to kind of clear my brain, get some fresh air. Uh, and then obviously the gym, which I usually try to do as soon as the market closes. Although sometimes on these earnings, earnings days, I might go in the middle of the day just so that I'm sitting in front of my computer when the earnings reports come out, which we're going to get today from, uh, a Tarian, which is the former Mohawk. Right. Uh, speaking of, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second because I have several questions lined up that I want to kind of hit on. Um, the first one was, I was going to say at 5 p.m. later today, I will be hosting a space covering the cannabis industry with uh, the self-proclaimed Wolf of Weed Street. And uh, I got a question about that, which was, let me just find this. What are your thoughts on some of the U.S., I don't know if you have any, some of the MSOs, the multi-state operators um, in the cannabis space, specifically U.S. ones like Curalee for Green Thumb Industries? Wait, say, say, okay, say it again. Sorry, I was uh, reading something. <laughs> no worries. Do you have any thoughts on uh, U.S. multi-state operators, commonly known as MSOs, in the cannabis space, um, specifically? And so not the Canadian ones, more like the U.S. ones, like right. Cura Leaf or Green Thumb Industries. Yeah, I mean, once again, just like the, the EB question earlier, I just don't track. I just don't, I don't follow enough of them. I mean, there's so many of them, I almost wouldn't even know where to start. Um, so, the, I mean, the way that I've been playing you know, the cannabis craze or the trend or legalization, whatever you want to call it, is with uh, GRWG, which is Grow Generation. Uh, my second favorite way to play it would probably be uh, Weed Maps, which is still a SPAC, SSPK. And then third would be uh, IIPR, which is a cannabis REIT. Um, and it, I, I just, I, <laughs> I don't trust my ability to pick any of the multi-state operators. So... Uh, you know, in my opinion, Grow Generation is sort of the Home Depot of the cannabis industry. And that's just for me, that's the safer way to play it. Got it. Got it. Um, I mean, there's 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 plenty of cannabis experts out there. I'm certainly not one of them. Mm -hmm. So, well, it's some, been, someone else can probably give them. Much right. I'll have some some of those cannabis time. experts. Well, be on my space at 5 p.m., including a guy who used to work for Snoop Dogg. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah. So come through. Uh, okay, I have a couple questions from some of my favorites in the crowd. So Nick Green's in here. Appreciate you being here, Nick. And his question is, given the growth at scale we have recently seen in mega caps, what is your main emphasis towards small to mid caps? Do you see yourself getting involved in larger cap names to balance the portfolio a bit? Um, yeah, I mean, I think about this all the time, not just because it provides some balance in the portfolio. Some of those stocks have pulled back a lot. I mean, and there's still some large caps that I do like, especially if the multiples can continue contracting. And then also just because I write a Substack write up and uh, it seems like a lot of retail investors jump into those stocks and then they, they tend to get shorted pretty quickly from the hedge funds. So, you know, if I was writing about larger companies, that would probably be less likely to happen. So that's another reason that I've thought about adding some large caps to the portfolio. I mean, like I said, I do have a couple large caps. I mean, Futu's market cap is still around 20 billion. Neo's market cap is probably somewhere in the 40 or $50 billion range. Those are the only two large caps that I own. Um, you know, I'm watching CrowdStrike. I mean, that it's still one of my favorite stocks out there. So there, there's, a, I mean, there's a few, I mean, I have an entire watch list of large caps on my, uh, on my screen that I watch every single day, but um, you know, I just thought the valuations were getting really stretched at the end of last year, which is why I sold all of them. Um, you know, even Fastly, Fastly got hammered. I haven't looked at it today, but it was down, I think, 20 percent after hours yesterday. You know, if Fastly got down to 40, I might even have to nibble on that one. But we'll see. I mean, for now, I'm primarily small cap and mid cap. I think that's where I can find the best opportunities for 
you know, growth over the next three, four or five years if I'm willing to be patient. I mean, I, if you take one of my small caps, let's just, you know, let's use Derm Tech as an example. I mean, what's, you know, there really is no large cap. I guess you could say exact sciences is probably a large cap comparison for Derm Tech. But I mean, if Derm Tech puts up the numbers that I think they can over the next four, five, six years, I mean, last year they did 6 million in revenue. This year, I think they'll do 18 to 20 million. And I think they have a shot at getting to a billion dollars in revenue by 2026. If they do that, then the stock's probably a 15 or 20 bagger. Um, there's no large cap out there that's going to do that. I mean, not at least not in my opinion or not not one that I've seen. So I'm still like I'm, I'm still on the younger side. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm 40 years old. Uh, I'm looking to invest this capital for the next 10, 15, 20 years until I really need it. And that's why I'm so focused on growth. And that's why I'm just not overly worried about these pullbacks. I mean, does a 50 percent pullback suck? Yes. I mean, I've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in my personal portfolio over the last month, which sucks. But I mean, that's kind of the that's that's the penalty that I have to pay for not being more prudent back in February and taking profits and putting on some protection with some put options, you know, lesson learned that happens to all of us. Um, but like, just because I'm down 50% in some of my favorite names, isn't going to shake me out of those names. I've done the research. I've built my models. I believe, I think I know where these stocks can go over the next three, four, five years. So there's just no reason for me to sell them down 50%. Um, unless something changes with the fundamentals or the story or management or, you know, I mean, there's a million reasons why you might sell a stock, but so far nothing's happened to get me out of my seven, eight, nine favorite stocks, which is really mm-hmm. where 80, 89% of my money is right now. So, yeah, I mean, this is just, this is the price you have to pay for investing in high growth, high multiple stocks. You know, you're going to run into these downturns and pullbacks, but, you know, go look at the charts of Amazon, Netflix, NVIDIA, Exact Sciences, you know, these are the best performing stocks over the last 20 years. And every single one of them had multiple pullback situation. Um, you know, for instance, Aterian, which is the former Mohawk, has been beaten up, like just beaten senseless over the last two months. The stock got up to $48 back in February. Um, I got into the stock back in December at twelve under $12. So, I mean, the stock went up 4x in like two and a half months and now it's pulled back to like 15 or 16. I mean, it's just insane. And then there was a short report a couple of days ago that, you know, it was burst basically like a, a character assassination of one of the former founders and, you know, legal trouble that he got into 15 years ago, like just kind of ridiculous, all the, the nonsense that was in that short report, none of which that was actually, um, you know, impactful on, on what the business is today and the business model and, uh, you know, e-commerce and Amazon and uh, M&As and that sort of stuff. Now, the company reports earnings today after the bell. Um, they've already given us guidance of $360 million for this year and $31 million of EBITDA. Yesterday, the stock, when it was at its lows or maybe even this morning, was down trading at like one t- 1.3 times sales. So, I don't think in my entire life I've ever seen a company that already gave guidance, full year guidance, 96% higher year over year, not including any more M&A. And it sold off so bad that it was trading at 1.3 times sales with gross margins in the mid to high 40s. Like just insane how much pressure that stock has been under, uh, you know, just to combinate mostly from the shorts, I'm sure. Uh, but it was also a very uh, retail, uh, you know, heavily owned retail stock. So, you know, once those shorts come in and put some pressure on a stock, it's pretty easy to shake out retail versus institutional. So we'll see. I mean, the company's going to report today. I think consensus is around forty nine point five million. So if they come in under forty nine point five million, I don't even know if the stock would sell off anymore because it's already down sixty five percent from the highs. I mean, of course, it might. Um, if they beat the number, if they come in at 50, 52, 53, 54, you know, you could see the stock rebound five, 10, 15% in the next couple of days, because now investors will have some renewed confidence that the story is still alive at Mohawk yep. so, or Italian. So we'll see now if they miss earnings and they lower guidance, right. I mean, that would be kind of like the, you know, <laughs> like a double punch to the gut. 
you know, then I have to, okay, even though I might still like the stock long term, you know, it's a it's a fifty thousand dollar loss in my portfolio. That's when I have to consider, you know what, like, okay, I still like the story long term, short term, this thing is beating the crap out of me. Maybe it's better just to take that fifty thousand dollar loss now, use that to offset some of the gains that I've already taken earlier this year. And then in 31 days, when the wash sale, you know, that wash sale rule is passed then I can decide if I want to get back in, you know, that gives me 31 days to kind of clear my head, you know, wait for, you know, any more weekends to kind of shake out of the stock. Maybe the stock drops another five or 10%. And then I can, you know, I can use that $50,000 tax loss against some of my profits. And then, you know, I might even be able to get in in 31 days at, at a lower cost basis than what it's trading at today. I'm not saying right. any of that's going to happen. You know, because I have no idea what earnings are going to look like today. I mean, obviously, I'm praying that they beat numbers. I don't know if they're going to raise guidance, even if they beat numbers. But that would be freaking glorious if they beat if they beat uh, consensus and raise guidance. I'm throwing a fucking Twitter party tomorrow. So let's do it. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll hold the space. We'll have the party. <laughs> um, real real quick, I just want to actually give a shout out. I just saw Akram's razor just popped in here, and I just want to say thank you to Akram because they were the first Twitter space that I ever went into, and kind of inspired me to uh, get Twitter spaces for myself and start hosting. And now it's like a freaking lifestyle. So thank you, Akram, and also uh, shout out to my mother who is in here, who's a huge Jonah fan, um, and really you know my mom yeah so mom's in here um she's chilling she's she's an investor i'm gonna have her probably on a space on sunday for mother's day what what's her favorite stock uh my mother well why don't i just bring her up so for a second if she if she can talk right now and i'll just have her come up and see if she can i don't know if she can uh she might be working but i know that she likes pen with me um i know that she likes some of the stocks that we've been chatting about upstart futu um she's definitely a big futu bull as well um, so definitely some of those. Well, we'll see if she gets up here. But um, in the meantime, um, also just thank you to everyone who's on here. Uh, one, one more time, I'll just say it without jinxing it as much as I can. If the space does for any reason crash, wait 90 seconds, I will create another space. Um, if you're following, you'll see the other space get created. So just letting everyone know. But thank you to Akram for being in here also and mom. All right, let's, yeah. And I see the comments now coming in in the DMs. Yes, I have my mom here. She's a huge inspiration and my, <laughs> my mentor and my role model and my everything. Um, I mean, I, I honestly, I wish I wish more parents got their kids into investing at an earlier age. She's up here. She's a speaker. All right, mom, what's your favorite stocks? You got any questions for Jonah today? Hi, Jonah. Hi, Gav. Hi. Hi, everyone. How are you? It's really fun to be on. And I'm sorry, there is background noise. I'm at the dog park with Cookie. Um, my favorite stock is currently Doge and Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, Jesus. All right. Well, you caught, <laughs> caught Jonah at the wrong time then. I know. I know. <laughs> but Jonah, I follow you and I follow your advice. And there go the dogs. Um, and, you know, some of those stocks are red and I, I think they're wonderful. Like, I love listening to you talk about um, is it DMTK and yep, yep. Celsius. And um, I definitely made some money on them last month. Sorry, the other dog's going by. It's Cookie. She has to bark at everybody. She's very yeah, friendly. Our our dog hates every other dog. Um, okay. <laughs> now now we just need these companies. I mean, because a lot of my stocks are down big in the last month or so, mm -hmm. and haven't even, haven't even reported Q1 earnings yet. So I'm hoping that we get some strong numbers that can help turn these stocks around. But you know, this market's been so unpredictable the last couple of weeks that even good numbers are getting sold off. Yeah. And being kind of new to investing, it's just like, I'm always, you know, texting Gov WTF, you know, <laughs> it's bloody today, boy. So for real, it's been, yeah, I feel like, yeah, it is. I mean, it, too many people, I think too many investors are just, they're new to a pull. They've never, they've never seen a pullback like this before. So I think it's easy to panic. It's easy to overreact. It's easy to lose sight of, you know, why you got into investing and how long, you know, what your time horizon is, you know, we've all probably made a lot of mistakes in the last few months by, you know, uh, not having enough balance in our portfolio by, you know, having too many of the same stocks that are all very highly correlated to each other. So, you know, when one's down, all of them are down. Um, you know, that's, that's been one of my issues as well. I could love all of my stocks for different reasons, but they all seem, you know, they all seem to trade, uh, pretty correlated to one another. So if one's down 3%, you know, cause small cap growth is getting hit. It's not like any part of my portfolio is, is green on the day. I mean, when, 
most of my stocks are either all they're all either in the green or they're all in the red. Yeah, it's mom again. It's such a comfort to hear you talk, Jonah, as a, you know, as an experienced investor and to be experiencing so many of the same things. And just a huge shout out to you, Gav, for for arranging these spaces where all of these people with lack of experience and all these people with all of these experience can come together and feel a sense of community, especially with the whole COVID situation. But I, I just love listening in and, you know, and I, I hear what you're saying, like I'm experiencing that with the red, but yep. just we just have to be, we have to be patient. You know, like I, I I'm just going to keep saying it. The pendulum swings both uh, too far in both directions. So, you know, the, the value and recovery stocks will probably get overbought and overheated. And then we'll see some of that money start to flow back into these beaten down growth stocks and growth sectors. And, you know, that, that pendulum just keeps on swinging both far and both, you know, too far in both directions forever and ever. I totally believe you. And that's why I'm probably a little bit more red than I'm comfortable with, but I totally believe you. So thank you for all your input. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right. Thanks, Mom. I'll, I'll see you soon. She's at the dog park. Enjoy the walk. Uh, got another question that I'm going to bring up here from... Oh, Mama Wolf is crushing it. Love these DMs. Um, going to bring up another question from one of my friends, Gemini Investments. And Gemini asked... And this is a good question. I was wondering too. Jonah, can you give some thoughts on RDFN just getting absolutely punished today after a pretty decent uh, earnings report? Oh... <sighs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I got into this stock. Uh, oh my God. I, didn't, I hadn't even looked at it in the last hour and a half. I didn't realize it was down that much right now. Um, <laughs> I haven't even looked at my account today. Just so everyone knows. I honestly haven't even turned on my, my computer. I mean, I've turned on my computer. I just haven't opened up my brokerage account today. Cause I didn't even want to look at how much I was down. Um, cause it's just, you know, after being down this much the last few days, it just gets depressing. It's not even healthy to, to look at all the red every day. You just have to wait for these stocks to find a bottom and start to bounce. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I took a 1% position in Redfin. Uh, I guess it was last week. Uh, yeah, I think middle or end of last week when the stock was approaching the, was it hundred day or 200 day moving average? I have to go back and check. Um, let me just double check. Where's the 200? Uh, yeah, I guess it was the 200. I don't know. I, I forget which which uh, which moving average I was using. But anyways, took a one percent one percent position as the stock was sitting on one of the moving averages. Um, I actually recommended in my stock Twitch room that anyone looking to take a position in Redfin should probably uh, use a stop loss in case it broke through, broke support. Um, I didn't use a stop loss myself, partly because it was such a small position, only 1%. Uh, I was willing to absorb any, you know, short term pullback and then just add to it. So um, I have a little bit of cash coming into my account tomorrow. And, you know, this is probably one of the stocks that I'll add to tomorrow if it's still in the low 50s. Very cool. Um, Got to. But I mean, I mean, I, I mean, in terms of like Redfin as the, you know, my thesis here, I mean, revenues were up nice over the last year. They're taking market share. Um, and then they're also expanding into rentals, Canada, mortgages, and a bunch of other uh, services. So I, I'm not sure what the big sell-off was. I don't know if it was, um, I think uh, losses were a little bit bigger than expected. Um, I don't remember. It, but gu- I, I believe guidance was much higher than expected, although part of that might be from the eye buying. So, you know, maybe it was just... Um, it, maybe the numbers looked a little bit better on the surface than what they actually were when you started to dig into them. So that could be part of it. But I mean, this is one of those stocks, you know, I still love the company long-term and what they're doing. Um, it's also a stock that's up. Let me see. Um, you know, it's, I think even after the sell-off today, it's still up 140% over the last 12 months. So, you know, maybe this is just one of those names that has to come back down to, I mean, it's now broken through all of the 200 day moving averages. So, I mean, there's really no, I'm not even sure where support would be. Um, Back in November, the stock got down to 38, you know, maybe that's where this stock finds some support, but hard, hard to know for sure. Got it. Um, So I have my friend stock market news is in here. Um, If anybody hasn't seen his account, he's doing some real wonders to the community and he's pretty, pretty bullish on the ARK stuff. And, you know, there's just a, there's kind of a shocking amount of hate going to Kathy Woods 
um, right now. And can you maybe just talk about your thoughts on some of the ARK ETFs? So, I mean, I don't own any ARK ETFs. I do look at them a little bit, but I mean, I was looking at ARKK this morning. Uh, I was going through the fact sheet. So if you go to ETF.com, type in ARKK, you can get the fact sheet on the ETF, see holdings, assets, all of that stuff. But one of the other numbers I always look at is uh, weighted average market cap. So, you know, that's basically the average market cap of all of the holdings, obviously weighted by allocation in the fund. And it's now over a hundred billion dollars. So, you know, whereas I'm still mostly focused on small and mid cap stocks, um, you know, ARKK and a lot of the other ARK ETFs, because they've brought in so much assets or AUM over the last six, 12 months, you know, they're now focused mostly on large cap stocks. I believe ARKG, which is the genomics ETF, is around 50 or $55 billion um, average weighted market cap, although that was a couple of weeks ago. I'd have to double check. So I don't I mean, I, I don't really compare my own strategy or my own performance as much to the ARK funds just because they're mostly large cap stocks. I look at like for me personally, I look at IWM, which is the Russell 2000 or the uh, IWO, which is the Russell 2000 growth, those are just a little bit more appropriate for me as a as a comparison or a benchmark. Um, I mean, ARC in general. So, you know, I was having this discussion with a friend today in, in the DMs. Um, if ARC does see outflows, my guess is they're pro- I mean, they'd probably sell off, uh, you know, some of their lower conviction names, regardless of market cap. But I would think if they had to meet redemptions and ETFs are very complicated, this is not like a hedge fund or a mutual fund. Um, ETFs are a little bit different. But if she was forced into selling, I think she would probably go to her large cap names first, which would give her better liquidity. I mean, if she starts unloading her small cap names where she has 10, 15 percent positions you know, or, or literally owns 10 or 15 percent of that company, I mean, she could I mean, like those stock prices could really start to collapse from all of that selling. Whereas, you know, if she was selling the large cap names, you know, the Apples, the Amazons, et cetera, even Tesla, for instance, um, you know, I don't think she would have as much of an impact on the, on the price. Okay. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know I, I've seen, I know a lot of people like to look at ARC uh, for the technicals. You know, I've seen lots of people posting, um, you know, ARC uh, sitting on the 200 day moving average. I agree with someone else that posted on Twitter today that it's really not a great idea to use ARC for technicals because it's just a basket of stocks, Um, you know, and that basket is always changing. It's probably better to use the indexes, but, you know, I mean, I'm not to say that it's not necessarily bad, but I'm just not sure how important it is that ARC is breaking, um, you know, breaking a support level versus one of the, the more broad indexes. Right. Got it. Got it. Um, Got another question, but real quick before that, um, I see Greg's in the space. I'll always appreciate Greg for. Wait, there's one more. Yeah. In terms of hate, like, yeah, I mean, that that's what happens with fund managers when they have bad days or bad months, bad quarters. I mean, people are gonna take out the pitchforks. You know, I mean, everyone loved Kathy. She was the queen for eighteen or twenty-four months. You know, as Tesla was ripping, Square was ripping. Roku was ripping and all of her genomics names were ripping. And now she's seen a, you know, significant pullback as well. And people are pissed, right? I mean, because a lot of the people that were a lot of retail investors that were buying her funds uh, have never seen a 30, 40% sustained pullback. You know, we got that last March, not even that bad, but we got a very quick snapback as well. Thanks to, you know, the Treasury and the Fed. Uh, now we don't have the Treasury and the Fed to bail out growth stocks. So, right. you know, we're not we're not going to see the same V-shaped recovery as that we saw last March in a lot of these stocks. They're going to have to, you know, shake out all the weak hands base um, and then start to grind higher, hopefully, as they, you know, as they put up strong fundamentals. Right. Right. Got it. Um, yeah. So for the next question, I'm just going to say Greg's in the crowd. Greg is officially the friendliest person on Twitter. Um, make sure you're following Greg so you can send him a wave via the wave emote on spaces. He loves getting wave emotes. Um, also, I got a pretty good. Uh, so just for so just for comparison. So I'm looking at the charts right now. If you look at the weighted moving average on the IWO, which is the Russell 2000 growth, 
it is sitting right on the 200 day moving average versus if you look at arc arc has uh broken it pretty substantially so you know that's where like it, it just depends on what someone's if someone's running a large cap growth portfolio you know a lot of these high growth innovation stocks then perhaps you know arkk is still your better benchmark for me personally it's iwo but right right um so this one's another good one um not sure if you've taken a look at it but beyond meat is basically back to its 52 week low uh, they, this, wow. this company has some wild spikes. You know, you look back in 2019, <laughs> yeah. they hit 234 on that 840% run up. Uh, even as recently as, you know, January, they were back to 192, uh, October, but yeah, they're back to 119, which is basically the 52 week low. So any thoughts on them? I know. I think we're, I mean, like I have all of these different moving averages set up on trend spider from 10, 20, 50, 100, 150, 200 day moving averages for simple, weighted, uh, exponential, etc. I'm going to have to start. I, I don't know what's after 200 day moving average. I mean, we're going to have to start coming up with like 250 day or 300 day moving averages because a lot of these stocks have broken, broken below the 200 moving average. And then you just have to I, I'm not even sure what, where some of them start to find support. You know, like people have suggested, it might be back, uh, you know, going back six, 12 months. Uh, to where these stocks were trading at, uh, either before the pandemic or, uh, you know, closer to the lows, which is crazy. But yeah, I mean, I don't follow Beyond Meat personally. I mean, I've tried the product. It's all right. Um, I've tried Impossible. I think Impossible is a little bit better. It's just my taste. Although if you go to Dunkin' Donuts and you get one of the egg sandwiches with the Beyond Meat sausage, it's actually really good. Like it honestly tastes. Yeah, but that's that's uh, Duncan. Everything come out and out of Duncan tastes pretty good to me. So, yeah, <laughs> especially the bagel. I love the everything bagel bites with these. Uh, they're stuffed with cream cheese in the middle. So freaking good. Like the Dunkin' Donuts is right next to my gym. So every like I'm not even joking. Every single day I go to Dunkin' Donuts and I get the stuffed bagel bites and then I drink. Uh, drink my Celsius and then go in and lift some weights. It's like my little routine fire. Um, yeah. I mean, beyond me, like I, I, I don't, I just don't follow the company well enough to know why this thing spiked from uh, where was it? January 12th, around January 12th, it was about one sixteen, And then looks like a week later, this thing was trading at holy shit, 221. Um, maybe two weeks later, this thing was trading at 221. So I don't know why it ran up that far that fast. My guess is it was, it was on some sort of a distribution deal, or maybe this was on those, uh, on that McDonald's news where McDonald's was going to come out with like, I don't know, some new product. And I think the expectation was that was going to be the beyond one of the beyond meat products. And, you know, maybe that ended up not being true. I'm not sure. Because now we're back down to almost exactly those January 12th prices before it had that big spike up. So, I mean, I know this has always been an expensive stock, you know, on a price to sales multiple. Um, let's see. BYND. I'm just curious to know what they're expected to. So it's about seven and a half million, seven and a half billion dollar enterprise value. Uh, looking for about what 583 million this year, 900 million next year. So, I mean, it looks like the company is expected to still put up some pretty big growth numbers, although still losing money this year. Looks like they'll lose about 30 million this year, maybe make about 25 million next year. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of people that think you know plant based food is the future. Other people say no way. Uh, I know you know Beyond Meat is should be one of these ESG companies because it is theoretically better for the environment because so much of our uh was it oh is it the carbon dioxide i forget i mean cat right cattle cattle are like one of the you know biggest threats to uh global warming and ozone layers um because i think it's all the uh oh shit what is it when when uh i don't know if it's the <laughs> i don't know we're getting getting some gross areas right now i don't know if it's the farting or it's like the actual, yeah it's the it's uh, the cattle farting feces right and i'm just what what gas is it is, that, is it carbon dioxide or something else? um yeah i don't know methane I don't, i'm not sure <laughs> methane. it might be methane yeah it might be methane actually cows and cows release methane into the atmosphere 
uh, it, but it's by far mostly human activity that dries up levels of the destructive greenhouse gases. So every time a cow burps or passes gas, a little puff of methane wafts right. into the We're atmosphere. trying to blame our problems on the animals uh, when really, you know, we know who's at fault here. Um, oh, yeah, it's humans. It's, it's human consumption of meats for sure. Right. Uh, yeah. So also, we, we keep having so many cool followers pop into here. Pulte's in here. Love Pulte. Hope you're having a good trip. I think he's traveling. Um, so thanks for everything you do. So many cool people in here. Love it. Uh, there's a question in here that's been waiting for a while. So I'm going to ask it. And that is, have you updated your thesis at all on ClearPoint Neuro, CLPT? Nope, nope. Um, I mean, I added to the stock yesterday. I think it, I have to double check, but I think it dropped below 19 yesterday. Nope. Um, this is, th this will be a long-term conviction stock for me. I did a write-up on it a few weeks ago, if anyone's curious. So you can subscribe to my Substack, free or paid, and see that write-up on ClearPoint Neuro. Uh, you know, the stock's had a nice run in the last six months. So, you know, perhaps this is just a little bit of consolidation. But, I mean, the thesis, the long-term story is still in play here. You know, there's really three ways that NeuroPoint uh, wins. So for anyone that's not, uh, doesn't, isn't familiar with the company, they are enabling real-time MRI imaging for neurosurgeons in three different ways. The first would be um, minimally invasive brain surgery. Second would be um, deep brain stimulation, you know, which is being used for epilepsy, epilepsy and whatnot, uh, and implants. And then third would be uh, drug delivery. So there are over 100 different drugs that are in trials right now that would be used for different brain diseases, neurological diseases, and by having uh, this this clear point system with the real time imaging, it enables those neurosurgeons to deliver those drugs to the exact part of the brain. Uh, so it's just way more precise and accurate than any and than any other method. So nope, um, I've I've talked to neurosurgeons multiple times about this company. There are several people on Twitter that I follow that uh, have been in this stock for the last couple of years. They know the company very, very well, and most of them have at least 25% of their portfolio in ClearPoint Neuro. Cool. So, you know, if you just do a if you just do a a, a search on Twitter for CLPT, uh, you'll see the six or seven people that talk talk about this company exclusively. So, if you're interested in the company, I would recommend following them. Uh, I mean, even a couple of days ago, I was talking with some people on Twitter in a thread that you can probably find. Where I think it's I think the name of the company is NeuroPace, uh, and it's sort of like a pacemaker device for the brain to control ep uh, epilepsy, and it's the ClearPoint system that's being used to install that in the brain. So, I, and I think in some ways this was sort of a like some of these medical device companies in in many ways are reopening stocks as well. You know, a lot of their uh, trials and sales forces were really held back during the pandemic where, you know, they weren't able to get into doctor's offices and hospitals to, you know, talk about their product, sell their product, continue, continue doing trials and whatnot. So, you know, as as I think we're up to what, 100 million people in the U.S. have gotten at least one or their second vaccine shot. I can't remember which one. You know, this pandemic is is coming to an end very soon i hope you know not well, not, not not everywhere but in the u.s hopefully no not everywhere all right I'm, I'm talking just u.s there is still a massive pandemic problem in other parts of the world but at least in the u.s i mean we're getting closer to the end or we're much closer to the end than we are the beginning so these sorts of stocks i i believe should start to see uh, an acceleration of their, you know, their business operations, you know, Derm Tech's another one, right? I mean, they, they did a lot of hiring pre pandemic and then uh, they were unable to get into a lot of those dermatology offices during the pandemic. And, you know, that's starting to change now. So, uh, I mean, just in terms of other countries not doing so well, um, myself and a few other people are putting together a fundraiser to raise money for, uh, I believe it's respirators going into India, where there's, there is clearly a a massive human, uh, humanitarian crisis right now because of the pandemic. So uh, I'll be posting that link in the next couple of days, I hope. That's awesome. Uh, love to see that. I uh, hope everyone will contribute um, you know, as much as they can um, to help that out. I actually did a, uh, a podcast with a 
uh, friend in India yesterday uh, talking about how he's an entrepreneur. He actually started a business growing um, plants in India that can be used as treatments for people that are suffering from symptoms of COVID. And uh, he actually started growing like it was a specific plant. I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but it had never been grown in India before. And he was the first one to start it and has like a whole growing process. So it's a pretty cool podcast. Um, also, I've been getting uh, so two things to note. One, um, I am not bringing people up for this specific call. But if you have a question, you can DM it to me. If I don't get it to it this time, I'm sure me and Joan are going to do another. Um, so we'll get to it then. Um, also, this space is being recorded uh, by my friend Josh Meltzer at Josh underscore Meltzer. So if you go to my pin tweet, you can see my YouTube, you can see my Spotify, I'm going to post it to both. I'm also going to post it to Twitter. So if you're following, you'll see it on here. Um, that's for that. And then I got a question from Eric for you. And that is, Eric is a huge fan of DM, which we talked about in the beginning of this call. And your deep dive, Eric says it's been his number one conviction company for almost four months now. And he wants to know if you have an opinion on Shapeways coming public via a SPAC. Yeah, so... I mean, there's a couple other companies out there that are also in the, um, so there's Shapeways, there's, uh, I think it's called Mark Forged, which I believe is coming public via SPAC as well. Um, I mean, all three are similar in some ways, although I do believe that Desktop Metal has the strongest management team, has the, uh, the highest quality and the fastest machines, um, but I mean, if I had to pick one main reason why I like desktop metal over the other two, uh, it's because of the diversity in their their machines and materials. So like I said earlier, I mean, they obviously started doing just uh, 3D printing for metals, but now they're doing all sorts of other composites, copper. I mean, you can go to their website and see a list of all the all the metals and composites that are available but now they're also doing polymers and then they're also doing wood as of today's announcement. So I, I just think if additive manufacturing becomes this massive industry, I want to bet on the company that has the, the best diversity of products, the strongest management team. They also have, you know, over $500 million sitting on the balance sheet from the SPAC and the pipe. Um, and what else? I was going to say one more thing. I forget. Um, and they're Massachusetts or Boston-based company. So that's another reason. Oh, speaking of Massachusetts, I actually got a funny comment, which was from the person, the guy that asked about Beyond Meat. And when we were talking about Duncan, he said, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I knew Jonah would comment on Duncan being a Massachusetts guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you go to other parts of the country, you can't find Duncan anywhere, but they are, they are all over the place in Massachusetts. So, you know, something we haven't really talked about today is short reports. Uh, are you familiar with the company DNMR, Danimer Scientific? Yep. So, um, yeah, thoughts on that short report? Uh, specifically, yeah. it mentioning overstated production figures. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't speak about the specifics off the top of my head. I mean, I think a lot of people know my, my general opinion of short reports is, you know, they're typically... Uh, it's a lot of lies and kind of misleading or twisting the truth, um, you know, character assassinations, which is clearly what was happening in the most recent one with the Terrian. Um, you know, there's I'll admit that there's always some red flags, like legitimate red flags that get raised in these short reports. And that's where it's up to management's responsibility to put out a statement within a couple of days, you know, refuting those those claims and providing some evidence or clarity as to why those claims or uh, accusations in the short report are not true. And I think most of the time these companies are good at responding. And unfortunately, by the time they get to respond, you know, the stocks are down 20, 30, 40 percent. And, you know, that short report is always out there. And then there's always these stupid fake lawsuits that pop up that really disappear within a couple of weeks and it's just a sleazy lawyers uh you know they're just ambulance chasers in a way you know trying to generate a couple uh, uh you know plaintiffs i suppose for a, a lawsuit and then go to the company and try to get a quick payoff like it's it's ridiculous that stuff really should not be happening uh, in terms of danimer scientific specifically so i think there was two main claims um one of which is that the company was uh, overstating its, you know, 
like Danimer said that they've they've basically sold out their capacity, which is why they announced recently that they were, I believe, spending seven hundred million dollars to expand their production capabilities. So I'm not really sure why the company would spend seven hundred million dollars to expand their production capabilities if they weren't already running into a capacity problem. So I, like I tend to lean on the company for that one. Sort of the same reason um, Archimodo, which makes those uh, electric vehicle, those three wheelers. I interviewed the CEO a couple weeks ago. I mean, they just announced recently that they're expanding their production facility 4X. Like, why would they why would they move into a facility four times larger than the current facility if they weren't expecting a big ramp up in orders? So like in those instances, I'm always going to lean, you know, lean on what the company is doing to look at their actions. The other one, I believe the other big acquisition uh, ac- um, uh, accusation in the report was the uh, decomposition time of their, um, you know, their biodegradable plastics, which is basically what Danimer is doing. Uh, and now Dan, I mean, for anyone that knows the company, I mean, Danimer has strategic partnerships with some very large companies that use a lot of plastics like Pepsi and Mars Candy. Uh, and there's, you know, those strategic partnerships are still in place. And Mars Candy's already announced that they're doing a big rollout with um, with uh, using Danimer's biodegradable plastics. I believe, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, I believe Danimer has said that their biodegradable plastics decompose in i think it's within three years and i think the short report said it's longer than that but not by much like i think they said four or five years if anyone knows how long it takes real plastic to decompose i think it's in the hundreds of years so if that's like the biggest you know knock against danimer and i don't even know if it's true or not is that their plastic their decom their biodegradable plastics decompose a year slower or even two years slower than previously announced, it's still a hundred years faster than regular plastic. So like, once again, I just think this is the short report making up crap to drop the stock price that they can profit off of the put options that they probably bought in the two or three days leading up to the short report. And you can go and look at all of these stocks and the options activity prior to the short reports dropping. And there's always a massive spike in put option buying. And then typically within a couple of days of the short report going out before the company has a chance to respond, they are covering those short, those uh, put option positions. And that's how the, the jackasses behind the short reports are making an obscene amount of money off of the short report. They are not putting out the short reports to be a good citizen or to try to, uh, you know, uncover some fraud. Uh, maybe like 1% of the time they're doing that. Like I think Hindenburg's report of Nikola was legit. I mean, Nikola is, you know, was clearly misleading investors with their rolling trucks. Um, But in a lot of these other instances, I mean, these short, these short reports are really pulling at some very, very thin threads and trying to make, you know, trying to twist the facts around so that they can benefit, you know, within a 24 to 48 hour period off of those put options. These, these short reports, Whoever's behind the short reports, most of the time you have no idea who the who they actually are. I mean, even though I think Muddy Waters is slimy and I think Carson Block is slimy, at least he has his name, you know, behind the company. A lot of these other companies, whether it's Culper or uh, maybe even Citron, I forget, and uh, Spruce Point, and there's a few others. You don't even know who the hell is behind these firms. No freaking idea. They are completely anonymous, hiding in privacy, because that's how they can manipulate the stock price in the short term. So those guys are not doing it to uncover fraud. They're doing it to make money, plain and simple. Got it. Got it. I think we have time for about one to two more, because uh, I think we're going to wrap around 2.30. So first off, this is not a question, um, just an observation. I did not realize that Fastly was down 27.5% today. Whew. Wow. Holy cow. That That's is a drop. Horrible. That is, yeah, 40% over the past month. The one I do have a question about because I'm getting some comments on is uh, TMDX. And that is currently you sold TMDX to get through the wash cycle. We, ex- we explained on our last call. I recommend everyone go and listen to yep. it. Um, maybe looking like you took a good time to sell that. It's down 36.34% over the past month. Um, finishing this wash cycle, do you plan on getting back in, especially now that it's at a lower price? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm like 90% sure I'll probably get back in next week. So I sold the stock on I just double checked the other day. So I sold TMDX on April 12th. 
This was after the FDA panel. So if anyone remembers, April 6th was the FDA panel for Transmedics to do their presentation for OCS Heart for DBD, which is donation after brain death. Um, and if anyone doesn't know, I mean, there's, I know there's a lot of people in this room. TMDX uh, is a company that's created these OCS machines or OCS units. OCS stands for Organ Care System. And this is how, you know, these systems are keeping organs alive longer uh, in between the transport from donor, which is when someone dies, to the patient, you know, or the recipient of these organs. And they got, last year, they got uh, FDA approval for their OCS lung machine. And then this year, they, you know, the first, first. Someone just tried calling me. Um, you can hear me, yep. right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so first up was OCS for DBD, and then next year will be OCS for DCD, which is donation after circulatory death. So the FDA panel, I mean, it was like 12, 13 people. I forget exactly. Um, the vote, you know, there, there was three, three parts to the vote, and each vote was, you know, they, they got the majority of yeses that they needed. Um, but this is only a panel that is supposed to, like, provide – guidance to the actual FDA when they make their decision, which is probably going to come either end of Q2 or early Q3. I mean, it's really hard to know. The FDA doesn't doesn't move very quickly and they don't really give you any uh, indication of when that might come. But, you know, typically it's two to three months after the panel hearing. Um, so even though the panel voted yes, it was the comments from the panel that were a little bit more negative and, you know, they, they kind of, they knocked T, uh, TMDX about some of the trials, some of the data, not really having any long-term data, not doing more studies on animals with the machines. Um, you know, and I mean, I, I can't refute that in any way. I mean, I wasn't there for the trials. The data is what it is. You know, perhaps TMDX didn't really um, you know, put these trials together as well as maybe the FDA would have liked. And that's why the FDA was so critical in their portion of the presentation. So the, the next morning, um, the stock opened 15% higher. And I thought that was great because, you know, we got the positive decision. But then the, you know, then the stock started sliding because uh, I think people were focused on those negative comments and what that might lead the FDA to do in their decision, which it sounds like if I had to guess that the FDA uh, approves uh, OCS heart for DVD, but uh, restricts it to cases where the transport time is expected to be over four hours. Because over four hours, or really, I mean, in reality, over three hours, maybe even over two hours, is when cold storage starts to kill the organ. So, you know, if you've ever seen like Grey's Anatomy or any other movie or tv show where you see them transporting organs it's all it's typically done in a cooler an ice cooler um and those organs you know all have a life basically like a shelf life of a couple hours or less before those organs start to die really from the you know the, the cold storage component so you know ocs heart ocs lungs ocs liver um, is really the only option out there other than cold storage, mm -hmm. especially for longer transport time. So, so the, the stock acted very negatively after the report. And since I knew that the FDA decision would not be coming for two or three months, I decided to sell the stock on April 12th, take the tax loss. And then after May, May 12th or May 13th, um, I can get back into that stock and still have that tax loss to use against my losses. And in this case, it looks like my cost basis, you know, will be lower than what I sold it at. So I sold the stock around 30. Now it looks like the stock is around 22 and a half. So maybe next week I'm able to get in at 22 or 23, which I know it sucks for the people that are still holding, but I mean, this was the right thing for me to do in my taxable account. And I still like transmedics for the next, for the long term because you know, o OCS heart for DBD is a smaller market than OCS heart for DCD, which we could get approval on next year, right? Because most organs are donated after someone has a circulatory death, not brain death. So, um, so the, the market opportunity is, is still very large for transmedics. 
assuming that they can get uh, approval for liver and OCS heart. So this, this actually rolls in perfectly to my next question. And that is you sold this to take that, um, the tax wash, but uh, for many, right, the, in the tax day for individuals was extended to May 17th this year uh, for 2021 in a bit of a unique case um, at the direction of the Treasury Department and the IRS. Is it possible that this now, the sell-off that we're getting right here this week where it's getting really low, and this was suggested by Caleb, so props to him, is it possible that more people are doing what you did and they had gains or maybe losses, whatever that they wanted to book or offset? And they're selling and they're going through their wash periods prior to uh, tax, tax day on May 17th? No, because that's no, because that's that's just the filing date. And that's when you have to pay your taxes. That has nothing to do with it, taking tax losses and account. So, OK, so that's not at all. Um, it doesn't at all factor into no, it. I mean, no, 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 no. If, if, I mean, I mean, tax losses, gains and losses are done on a calendar year basis from January 1st to December 31st. So. You know, that that April 14th or May 17th, whatever the new date is, has nothing to do with taking a tax loss on transmedics. I mean, whether you you could take the tax loss any time this year and you'd be able to use that tax loss to offset gains from this year when you file your taxes next year. So just taking the loss this past month on transmedics, I'm not going to actually benefit from this until I file my 2021 taxes. Got it. Got it. That makes sense to me. So Jonah, that's, um, that's my time for today. I really appreciate you coming on and answering really so many questions. I think the audience is extremely grateful as well. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people came through and listened, uh, probably 500 different individual people. Um, hopefully we'll run this back again next week. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sure Love to see it. Let's, let, let's hope the markets are green a little bit more fun. Yeah. Now. Yeah. We'll have, we'll have some green days, um, with it. We'll be, having some more uh, topics to chat about anything you want to say to everyone before we uh, log off? Um, no, I mean, see everyone listening has their own portfolio, their own style, their own risk tolerance, their own time horizon. I mean, at the end of the day, you shouldn't be following anybody or trying to copy anybody unless you're comfortable with their style and com comfortable with the, you know, the types of stocks that they buy. I tend, you know, like I said earlier, I'm a longer term investor. I'm only 40 years old. I don't need this money right now. This is my retirement money, my, you know, second house money, whatever the hell it might might be. I'm comfortable taking um, more risks and investing in higher growth stocks than some people. So I just think you have to be and then, like my style is not right for everybody. You know, not not everyone has the same conviction in Upstart or Clearpoint or Derm Tech or Celsius that I do. I mean, I've done a significant amount of research on these companies. I've talked to experts in the industry. I've talked to the CEOs. I've talked to the investor relations. Like, I feel like I know these companies really well. I feel like I could probably work at these companies. Like, I could be a salesperson for half of these companies because I know them so well. Feels like you are. Um, and that, yeah, for real, serious, especially Celsius, right? And even Upstart. Celsius, sponsor um, my spaces. Okay, I got it in. <laughs> But that's what gives me the conviction to hold through these downturns. And uh, I'm just not like, I'm not stressed about me losing money. Um, I'm stressed about anyone that tried copying me and they're losing money because I know that they don't have the same level of conviction and patience that I have. So I'm worried about them, you know, many of them that bought at the top and now they're getting ready to sell at the bottom, which is the worst possible thing you can do you know, for, for generating long-term returns. I mean, we all talk about doing the opposite, right? Buying the lows, selling at the highs, you know, that's also very difficult, but you know, after you've absorbed a 30, 40, 50% pullback in your favorite stocks, that is not a good time to give up on those companies. I mean, you bought them for a reason. You believed in them for a reason. Don't give up on them just because they've pulled back. If the fundamentals have changed, you know, that's a different story. But if the fundamentals haven't changed, if the business model hasn't changed, if the opportunity is just as big now as it was two months ago, and the only thing that's changed is the stock price, that's not a good enough reason to sell most stocks. Wait. So mm -hmm. I know I know it's cliche to say be patient, focus on the long term, but that's how I approach you know my portfolio, and that's my investment strategy. I absolutely agree. Uh, everybody, you know, transparency is so key, and and more people are transparent nowadays than ever and are open to sharing their trades, sharing their due diligence. Um, but we're all responsible for really our own monetary decisions. 
And when you go and place a trade, you know, and it doesn't go the right way. Uh, well, that's not, that's, that's nobody else's fault, right? That's, you know, you got to go and you got to make that. Also, a childhood dream. I missed an opportunity because he was just in here for a second. MySpace Tom was just in here. I saw him. What? MySpace Tom was just in here with the blue check mark. I should have taken a screenshot. <laughs> he was just listening to us for like a minute. Uh, I guess, oh. I guess I bored him, but childhood dream is uh, successfully done. MySpace Tom was in my Twitter space. <laughs> uh, that's, 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 that's the note that I want to end on. Um, that was perfect. I did. I, yeah. one, one feature that's missing from Facebook is the top eight. We need the top eight. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll get Tom on it. Um, okay. All right, Jonah, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. I'd love to end on that note. You got it, man. And yeah, everybody take care. Have a great rest of your day. Hopefully some more green skies ahead. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.